Welcome everybody to The Rock here in Pinetown and I'd like to wish you all a very, very happy and prosperous and blessed new year. Last week I spoke from Isaiah chapter 9 starting at verse 6 when it said, for unto us a child is born, unto a son is given, which was brilliant because a child was not only born to us, but it was also given to us. Well, now that we know that, that, that the child has been born, the son's been given, and the government would be upon his shoulders. And of course, the government would go, goes upon the high priest from the tribe of Levi. And, that, and on that tribe, then it says the government will rest upon his shoulders. The high priest would then have the, the symbols of the 12 tribes of Israel, six on either shoulder as he was putting on his regalia. Everything was great. It goes on to say, and he is counselor and mighty God. He's wonderful counselor. He's not just wonderful and he's a counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. And the reason he's a wonderful counselor is because he's got to counsel you and I. And, and that's not easy. You know, this church, uh, you know, he looks, must look at the rock and go, oh, Pineville Junction. Uh, I've got to be a wonderful counselor there again. But he doesn't look at it like that. He comes and he, he does it for us. And he says, the, the Bible goes on to say, and the prince of peace shall be, he shall be the prince of peace. It's called, in Hebrew, it's called Sar Shalom, the prince of peace. And Shalom and, and just doesn't mean peace. It means everything. It means purity. It means wholeness. It means health. It means prosperity. It means wealth. And we said, and that's what we, what I spoke on last week, that's what he's going to be. And that is what's coming through the ages. Today we've got the king is coming. Why? Because he, the prince of peace, will be the king of kings. Not just a king, but the king of kings. And we look around today, one week later, and what changes have we found? we still got war. We still got fighting in Ukraine. We still got starvation in Sudan. We still got diseases everywhere, and and we've still got uh, all of this evil and 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 murder and and dissent all over the world. We just heard this morning how people in, in England are being just stabbed and killed and shot in places where they shouldn't that shouldn't happen. We've still got poverty. None of these things have come to pass. None of these things have gone away. But I've learned something. I learned what I learned, and I learned this many years ago. When I say many years ago, how old am I now? I'm about 32. So I'm, I must have learned this about four years ago. And it said, I, I remember thinking to myself, I will never, ever make a New Year's resolution. Has anybody ever thought of that? Has anybody ever said, how many people have made New Year's resolution? How many, not this year, but in their lives, have you made a New Year's resolution? You bunch of little teeny weeny. Oh, you have. Okay, right. Yeah, and we did, and, 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 and then we always fell by the wayside. Okay, well, this, way, this year's nothing's changed. I, have, I didn't make a, a New Year's re res uh, resolution at all. We, we still have got the starvation and we still have got the poverty and we still got all the problems and, the, and we've got deception from the governments, from the media, from social media. We've got, we have got deceptions even from churches. Can you believe it? We've, we've still got deception. We've got, we've got deception from born again Christians who are so adamant about whatever they are flag that they're waving, they're missing the post. The post is that Jesus was on the cross Jesus died for each and every one of us, and everybody's waving every other flag that we shouldn't do. You know what? It's the Holy Spirit that should be putting you straight, not people, not the church, not your pastor, not all pastors, not your pastor. Nobody should be putting you straight. The Spirit of God comes into you, and it's through that he works from the inside out. He works like a potter works a clay. He works from the inside out. We still got money, and we still got corruption, and we still got downright, if I may say it, downright stupidity when it comes to what we listen to and what, what we hear. So anyway, Happy New Year. And it's got, it's got to be a good one. 
But things have changed. Why? Because the king is coming. The king is coming, and not just the king. The king of kings is coming because the king came. Remember, King Charles III of England, he's come, but we weren't waiting for him. In fact, he was the only one waiting for him, I think. But <laughs> the king of kings is definitely coming, and he is get, it's getting closer and closer and closer, and every day we're getting closer. Whether we're getting closer by old age, well, I'll soon see you, Lord, because I'm not getting any younger anymore. Whether it's through health problems, whether it's through finance problems, whether it's sickness, but we know that the Lord is coming soon. And we see that through good things, good things that are happening, sometimes hard things have to happen. We look in the book of Acts when we saw, hey, you know what? The, the, Jesus was a Jew, or, or the tribe, all his disciples were Jews. But when we look at Acts 12, we, we see, hey, a few Gentiles not getting saved. And I wonder if God knows this. I wonder if this is quite, quite true. The problem is we've got to listen. We've got to listen to what God is saying. We've got to see how God is leading us. We've got to see and, and just follow the word of the Lord. You know, if we can stick to the word of the Lord, there's so much stuff going around social media that you would, you, your head would twist off. I remember I used to sit in, in my little back garden. I still sit in my little back garden, by the way. And, and we have lovely little birds twerping. We've got some, uh, those little, what do you call, bird feeders. And we sit in um, the bird feeders. But I usually sit with my back to the bird feeder. And my wife would sit looking at the bird feeders. And she'd say to me, oh, look at that beautiful little bird. Now, for me to look at that little bird, I would have to, to spin my head round. And that is not a good thing, especially when you get to my age. You cannot spin your head around so much. Anyway, the, the Israelites, they wanted a king. And God, they said, look, I want to be your king. But they said, no, we want to be like other nations. We want to have a king. And in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, verse 14 through to 23, he said, all right. He said, we'll... we'll David says, right, I'm going to go out. Now, what had happened, a battle had happened. Let me put it in context. It was a battle. And they had the, the ark, they had the, the tabernacle of Moses. Now, Moses was long gone. Uh, he had passed away, and he had, he had, he's gone to be with the Lord. But his tabernacle, they used to carry it around. Remember the tabernacle? They had the holy place. They had the holy of holies. And that's where they kept, kept the ark of the covenant. And the, it was captured by the Philistines. The Philistines took it away to a place called Gath. And then they took it to Gaza, and they moved it all over the place. Because everywhere they took it, they got sick. Okay, everywhere they took it, everywhere they they were parading it around like they do with the World Cup. You seen them with the World Cup? Uh, who remembers the World Cup? It was only a week ago. The, 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 the soccer World Cup, the football World Cup. Do you remember the, the South African Rugby World Cup? Do you remember when they took it to Cape Town? It was stolen. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing changes, eh? <laughs> But they took, this, they took this Ark of the Covenant, and they took it all over the place, and they took it around, and every place they encamped it, the Philistines, something happened. The, 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 the Bible says they got boils. In fact, one of the Bibles says that one of the tribes actually got piles from having, and they wanted to get rid of this Ark of the Covenant. Anyway, David said, right, I'm going to go and relieve you of, you, of it. They had it for 30 years. And they thought it would protect them, it would bring them good luck. You know what? It brought them nothing but bad, bad health. And David went and he took it. And, but they still, had this, they still had this tabernacle of Moses. But David went and he rescued it and he got it back and he took it back. He fought it and he got it back and they, basically they gave it to him. They said, listen, this, this thing is it's no good. <laughs> we haven't sat down for about six years. They said, please take, take this from us. And as David took it, he could feel the glory of God. Oh, yes, he made some mistakes. Don't we all? Haven't? There's not one person in this room who hasn't made a mistake. Not one. In fact, I've probably made more mistakes than most people in this room. And, you know, I used to often say, if you knew how many mistakes that I made, you wouldn't want me to be your pastor. And then I used to say, and if I knew how many mistakes that you made, I wouldn't want to be it either. <laughs> but anyway, David came along. And he took this, 
And he, not only did he take back the Ark of the Covenant, he took back the presence of God because now God had left the Ark of the Covenant. He had, his presence had gone. Now when his presence came back, the joy came into the heart of King David. And he danced. Boy, could this guy dance. He danced and he danced and he danced in front of the priests. He danced in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And he was dancing down the road and he was taking his clothes off as he was dancing. Now, one of the reasons that um, when King David, as we remember him as the boy David who cut off the head of Goliath, and one of, the, one of the rewards he got was to marry the king's eldest daughter, and the king's eldest daughter was called Michal. And she looked out the window, and she didn't think, she thought, no, this isn't the way a king should act. And he was acting, and he took off. It says he was dancing in his ephod. His ephod would be like me dancing just in my jacket. Don't even think of that. And he was praised. He said, I'm not only just taking it back, back the actual covenant. He says, I am taking back the praise. He got the ark and, and he got Israel back. He got their vision back. He got their sense of, of where they're going back. From the oldest one, as we said earlier, which would have been Kenya because he's unfortunately he's ill today, right through to Jackson. He would have, he was... Praise, they were praising the Lord. They were all praising God. The Bible says they were all praising God. And they were anticipating. They were anticipating, as I saw this or coming, they were anticipating, anticipating their king coming, and their king was King David. But if they had had good, proper pair of spectacles, they would have seen two kings coming because they would have seen the king of David coming, the king of Judah, who became the king of Israel coming, and they would have seen the king of kings coming. They would have seen the king of kings coming. You know, I went to get my eyes tested the other day, and I, I said to the, the uh, I think he said dentist, I was in the wrong place, hey? you really do need your eyes tested, don't you? <laughs> I said to the optician, I said, you know, I said, I can see through one eye pretty good. I said, if I look through this eye, I can see, but I've got to close this eye. I says, maybe it's a monocle that, that you should be making me, making him laugh, which it didn't, okay? And, and I said, but then I suppose when this eye gets sort of uh, too weak, I would need another monocle, which I thought would make him laugh, which it didn't. And I said, and if two monocles got married, that they would make a spectacle of themselves. Anyway, I... I, I I, I stopped at that part there. I didn't say any more to him. But here we've got now back in place a strong king, gave it a strong leadership. The king of Judah, he, the king of Judah, he took it away from King Saul. King Saul was the king of Benjamin, the, the tribe of Benjamin. But king of Judah, you know what Judah means? Judah means praise. It means praise. If you should be praising God in everything, we don't praise God enough. We should be praising God in our homes. We should be praising God in our works. And it doesn't matter whether people laugh at us or not. It doesn't matter. I wouldn't suggest dancing down the road with no clothes on, but it doesn't matter what people say. When you praise God, you praise him and praise him in everything. You praise him for every little thing. And I know my wife praises our, by the way, Jackson is our great-grandson, not just our grandson, our great-grandson. So when, whenever the little guy sort of gives a bit of a mess, praise you, Jesus, that everything's working in your stomach. Praise you, Lord. And anybody who didn't understand what my wife was talking about would think she was a little bit off the head. But the thing is that we must not be embarrassed of things that we say. You see, when the, when the ark was taken away, it, 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 the, the presence of God was taken away with it. And although the enemy had, they had the symbol, they didn't have the thing. They had the tradition. They didn't have the spirit. They didn't have the glory. David came dancing out of his clothes and, and he, the anointing that Samuel had put on him, Samuel put the anointing on him, and that anointing, remember last week when we anointed some people, that anointing went all the way through, and it took its time going, and it's still coming, and it's still coming, and it's still coming, and now we've got King David from the tribe of 
praise. Yes, he made big mistakes. He made mistakes. But he still kept the blessing of God. He still kept the favor of Israel. He still kept the praise into Israel. He still kept the seed. Remember the seed in, 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 in uh, Genesis 3, 15 and 16 when God said the seed of the woman. He still had that seed. And that seed was still going to come through. And don't forget, when Eve wasn't a Hebrew, she was a Gentile. She was a far off according to the Bible. But she, she's had that seed. He still brought the leadership. And when David brings back the ark, it, it, it's the king coming, but it's the king of kings that's coming. We heard this morning when Bev read it out, she said that, you know, God hates the certain things. And what does he hate? Well, he doesn't like a haughty eye, which gives means that you're proud. We shouldn't be proud. We've got nothing to be proud of. We should be content. We should be content and be content that we have got the Lord. You sh he, he hates a lying tongue. Let's praise the Lord. Are you a Christian? No. Keep your tongue to yourself. Yes, you are. Praise God for it and, and speak out about him because a lying tongue he does not like. He, he's, he, he doesn't like innocent blood. We heard of those horrible deaths that was in Birmingham and Liverpool. And they're in South Africa. They're all over the place, these horrible deaths. And he does not like the shedding of innocent blood. And he says, get away from that evil devious heart because that's where it is that's what he said to he said to samuel he says no you've got he says here's what you've got he says you've got a heart of 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 me a man who's got my heart now you, you've got a man who's not got my heart <clears throat> now you think well how can david have have his heart when david was so when he did so many things because David had the heart of praise. David had the heart to praise God and to lift him up and to give him what he needed and to show the glory of God. We shouldn't be quick to accuse people. We so often run and jump and accuse, and this is what Bev read this morning. We shouldn't be bearing false witness and telling lies and putting people in different places, and we shouldn't be stirring up dissension in any way it, whether it be in the church or whether it be in your work or even if it's in your family, there should be no stirring of dissension. It's seven things that God hates, but the Bible says that everything, everything, everything that has got... I, I, I went to my granddaughter's house the other day and she's got cockatiels in it and she's got a, a hedgehog in it. You don't see many hedgehogs. But the Bible says everything that has breath, let it praise God. Everything from a hedgehog right the way through to a baby, to a middle-aged man, to a woman, to an old-aged person. Everything that has breath. Why? Because God breathed breath in. And with man, he breathed breath and he breathed his soul in there. And that is everything. We have got to give, we have got to give praise and glory to our God. Now, <clears throat> David, he said to Samuel, I'm glad that you found me, he says, because I do have the heart of, of God. And he says, I'll tell you what I want to do. He says, I want to take this Ark of the Covenant. Now, this, whoa, don't touch the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody that touches the Ark of the Covenant is going to die. He says, no, I'm going to take it. He says, I want to take the Ark of the Covenant. He says, yes, this guy touched it and he died. But he says, I want to take the Ark of the Covenant, but I want to do something new with it. I want to take away tradition from this Ark of the Covenant. He says, I want to do something that's completely, completely new. He says, I do not want to take it to the tabernacle of Moses at Gibeon. He says, I want to take it to Mount Zion. I want to take it to Jerusalem where it belongs. He says, I'm getting rid of this tradition. See, tradition dictated that the Ark should be kept back in the Moses tabernacle behind a veil away from the people. But you know what? When, this, when it was stolen, the people were still worshiping the veil. They were just doing it because it was tradition. And unfortunately, we as Christians today, we worship the emblems and we worship the statues and we worship the crosses and we worship things that shouldn't be worshipped. The only thing that should be worshipped is the living God. 
That's the only thing that should be worshipped. But we worship our denominations. We worship the churches we go to. It's like as if we're in a, a club. We're not in a club. We are a family, and God is the head of that family. David got away from this tradition. He says, I'm taking it for, look, 30 years it's been away. He says, and I'm not taking it back there. He says, we need God's glory more in this place. And do you know what he built? A tent, a one-bedroom tent. And in that tent, there was no veil. And who could see the Ark of the Covenant? Everybody. All the Gentiles. They could, they could see it. They saw the whole lot. Well, we, we, although we love a lot of things, David danced before the glory of the, he, he actually broke all the rules. But in Acts 15, there came a problem. You see, because Jesus died. And, and when Jesus died, the church began to grow. And Jesus was a Jew, and Peter was a Jew, and they're all Jews, and there was a Jewish little congregation. They used to meet in the synagogue. But all of a sudden, the Gentiles started to thinking, hey, you know what? This is, we, we, could, we could go to this. And then, they thought, oh, would you guys eat? like bacon sandwiches and, and hamburgers and you, you mixed your, 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 your milk and you mix your cheese and you mix your, your meat together. You, we can't do this and you're not circumcised and, uh, you know, you, you, you eat food that's sacrificed to foreign gods. And guess what happened? I'll tell you what happened. I'll read it to you. It came in Acts chapter 14, 15. And this, this is a, this is a, a, a cracker, this one. The, uh, the, the reason I like it is because of who it came from. It came from Jesus' half-brother. And Jesus' half-brother was James. And James, if you read the book of James, it's a very staunch, strict book. And he says, he's, he's the one, he says, and when, the, when they'd all finished talking, uh, James spoke up. He says, brothers, listen to me. Simon, now his brothers, listen to me. Simon, who that was, Peter, has described to us how God first showed his concern by asking, by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. How did he do that? Well, in Acts chapter 10, Peter was told to a house in, in Caesarea and a, to a guy called Cornelius, who was a Gentile. He was a Roman. And Peter stood there and his face just gaped open when Cornelius spoke in tongues and Peter couldn't understand it. And James says, this is what he did. James believed him. He says, listen, this is what happened. He says, and the words of the prophets, now they go back to the Old Testament. They says, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this. In other words, it's not something that wasn't spoken about. It's not something that we've written it into. It's something that actually happened. And he reads it, and, and in region, Acts 15, verse 16, he says, the Lord says, and after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it. That sounds good. That the remnant of men may see the Lord. And so the remnant of the Jews will see the Lord. But good, guess who else is going to see it? And all the Gentiles who bear my name, praise God. I thank God I'm a Gentile. I really do. Says the Lord who does these things. He got that from Amos chapter 9, verses 10 through 12. But isn't it amazing? Do you know what the Jews do today? Um, they stand up. One of their prayers is, thank you, God, you did not make me a woman. Okay? Another one is, thank you, God, you did not make me a Gentile. And, and you think, well, that, that's a bit rude, isn't it? You know, you stand beside your wife and think, oh, thank you, Lord, you didn't make me like her. And, and, and we would take umbrage to it. But what he means is that God put more responsibility on mankind. He gave them more laws. Remember the Jewish laws? There were 613 Jewish laws. He put 613 Jewish laws on the men. He didn't put them all on the women. The women had their own laws that they took out of that. And the Gentiles had very few laws. And the men said, thank you, you didn't make me that because I wanted to do more laws. Why? Because, Lord, I want to serve you more. I want to serve you more. So, therefore, the, the laws that you put on me 
great, I will do that. Of course, when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, about 240 of those laws they couldn't do anyway because they couldn't do sacrifices anymore. You know, James said God would not fill the Gentiles with the Spirit of God if he hadn't have given them an exemption. You have got an exemption. You are in. You're not, I'm, 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 but I'm not Jewish, but you're in. Why? Because you believe in Jesus Christ. Because you have got my name on you. You have got my name on you. You have got my name on you. Everybody in here has got God's name on them. Why? Because he's known you for a long time. How long do you think God's knowing you? And I know some people say, well, I remember when I stood up and I got saved and I came forward. I want to tell you something. How long did he know Jeremiah before he was born? Who else did he know before he was born? All of us. And Jesus, he knew all before we were born. And, and, and this is the thing, he says, before you guys were born, he says, I knew you all. The Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does, does, does these things that have, that have been known for ages. They don't do these things that have been known for ages. One thing that I like to go, and I'm just going to quickly to, to Mark chapter 10, I'm going to finish now. People were bringing the little children to Jesus to, to have him touch them. But the disciples said, no, whoa, 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 this is, a Jew. you just, just don't do that. Now, that's Jesus here. Um, he's just fed the 5,000. He's just walked across the water. He's just turned a whole pub full of, of water into wine. He says, you don't, you, no, no, no. He says, this, is, this, this man is a holy man. Jesus says, he rebuked them. He bringing the children to Jesus to have them touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. You know what he said to them? He said, let the little children, let them. Let them come to me. Let the mothers bring them to me. Let the fathers bring them to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God, what was Jesus talking about the whole time? The kingdom of God. The, from, from his very first words, his very first words was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He says the little children were, were examples of what the kingdom of God is going to be like. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Hey, look, at the way that, look at the way the children, I can see little Jackson and he's snug and fast asleep and he's content in his mother's arms. I know for a fact that some of the older people here are snug and fast asleep as well. But that's not what I'm trying to say. You can see the point I'm trying to get across. And he took the children and he took the children in his arms and he lifted them up and he blessed them. And can you imagine them being blessed? Do you remember the old man when he was in the temple and he says, please, can I see the baby? And, 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 and he took the little baby up and he says to God, now I have seen the Messiah, the one who will be bringing the light onto the Gentiles. He says, now, Lord, I can die in peace. What a way to go. What a lovely thing to do. If God knew Jeremiah, if God knew Jesus, and if God knows you in your womb, and, and when you, before you were born, you've got nothing else to worry about because God knew you when you were far away. And now he's coming for you. The king is coming, and he's coming for us. Remember that song, The King is Coming? And he's coming for you. The marketplace is empty. There's no traffic in the street. The children's tools are lie idle. No more time to harvest wheat. Why? Because the king is coming. And he is coming. And when he comes for us, he is going to come for each and one and every one of us. But I want to say to you something. Are you ready for the king when he comes? Are you ready when he comes? Are you ready to be open arms and say, or are you prepared to... Uh oh no, no, we don't do that in this house. Be prepared. Why? The king is coming. Father, we thank you that we can be here today, and we thank you for the very breath that you give me. I thank you, Lord, that...
for the folk who have come and who those, the Bible says, those who have an ear, let them hear. Those that can hear, they hear by the word of God and they can only hear by the word of God if the word of God is being read out to them. So I give you, Lord, a great thanks because this is an absolute pleasure for me to be able to speak the word of God to the folk that you have entrusted me, these lambs, these sheep, these people, these children, your image, Lord, each of them, each of them in your image is here today. And I just thank you in Jesus' precious name.